Uh, the uh, Dias party is arriving. Uh, we have with us uh, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter, Walter and Joan Mondale, Director of Presidential Library Sharon Fawcett, Mayor Shirley Franklin, Mayor Sonny Perdue and his wife Mary, Reverend Joseph Lowry and his wife Evelyn. Please welcome our guests. Welcome to a grand day in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Jay Hakes, the director of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum. We've got a lot going on today. We are reopening a new museum, totally new. And you might say, why would we do a new museum? We had an old museum. But technology has changed. The young people who are here today, they're looking for education and information in different ways. So we went out and built the highest tech presidential museum in the country, the most energy uh, friendly and environmentally friendly uh, museum in the country, and we are extremely eager for you to see it. It is very family friendly. It is very uh, interactive. Uh, we went out to get the best people in the world to work on this. So we have here today Patrick Gallagher, one of the great uh, designers in the world is with us today. Uh, Jay Barnwell, the head of DNP Productions, is with us today, and three great film companies, the uh, uh, Cortina Brothers, uh, Bill Vanderkloot, and uh, uh, G2 Productions. And you will see some one-time-in-a-world technologies that are available nowhere else. And this is going to enable us to be better part partners uh, in the Atlanta community. Now, you can't have technology without having content. So we had to have something to talk about with this new technology. And fortunately, the people that we're talking about, uh, one, one of them is celebrating an 85th birthday today. Uh, and uh, and it puts a lot of pressure on a museum designer who only has 25,000 square feet because he was not idle for any of those 85 years. But this is the story that's been added of the post-presidency and the advancing of human rights, which is a theme that goes from the early childhood uh, through the governor's years, through the presidency, and through the great work of the Carter Center. So we uh, are excited about this. We're excited in partnering with neighboring uh, institutions like the Martin Luther King Historic Site, uh, with the new Center for Civil and Human Rights, uh, working in partnership with the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau, and and uh, uh, the uh, Georgia Humanities Council's other groups that work closely with us to provide one of the world's great uh, uh, educational experiences. We have distinguished speakers today, and they're going to introduce themselves. They're all well known, and they're in your uh, program. I would just say there's been a program change. Uh, the acting archivist of the United States, Adrian Thomas, was, uh, her schedule was disrupted by one of the congressional committees in Washington. Uh, which can happen from time to time, but we're very pleased to start off with the director of Presidential Library, Sharon Fawcett. Sharon has been uh, the acting archivist on time, at times herself, and we had a lot of federal work done to this building that was expedited to make this day possible, and we're grateful for that. So Sharon will start off, and we'll have a great day celebrating this reopening. Th 
Thank you very much, Jay. This is a wonderful day, and I am delighted to be here representing the National Archives. There are hearings, actually, this very day on the nomination of David Ferriero to be the 10th Archivist of the United States. Now, isn't that the greatest title in the world, next to President of the United States? <laughs> And I know that once he's confirmed, this place will be on the top of his travel list uh, for the coming year. Um, the presidential collections are the most vital and valuable of our nation's historical assets. The National Archives has no more important mission than to preserve them and make them accessible to all those who need them. Twelve presidential libraries housing these collections have been given to the nation. Dedicated on this day in 1986, the Carter Library became the eighth presidential library managed by the National Archives. But the gift of a presidential library, you know, it's, it's not over when you've given it to the government. It's uh, a gift that needs to keep on giving. It's a commitment to the future of the library. Uh, it, it takes um, the participation of many of the donors in the community for the ongoing support that makes the library able to extend its mission beyond the very important one of being a place for historical research. Because of these long-term commitments, presidential libraries are able to make unique and vital contributions to communities across the nation. Through its museums, nonpartisan public and educational programs, the libraries provide an opportunity for understanding individual presidents, the historical context of the times in which they lived and served, the roots of the ongoing issues that confront our nation and the nature of the American presidency. Scholars and citizens gather in these libraries to ponder, interact, and discuss the actions of our government and consider issues local, national, and global in scope. We're here today to reopen the Carter Library's museum to the community of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, and indeed the nation. This magnificent new exhibit, which I saw last night, uh, extends the collections of the Carter Library in innovative and engaging ways to the hundreds of thousands who will visit here. The exhibit itself is a vital link in the narrative of American history, helping you to understand the critical events that took place in President Carter's administration, the beginning of our understanding of energy issues, and the complexity of our relationships with the Mideast. You will also see the events and values that shaped the life of our 39th president and the role he continues to have in shaping democracies and improving the lives of millions. We want students to come here to be inspired by the past, to see the possibilities of, for our future, and to see that they have a place in the civic life of our nation. For those who have lived these times, we hope the exhibits and documents, and so many of them have been declassified recently, provide a broader contextual understanding of the events and some fun in remembering the 70s. I mean, John Lennon, uh, Star Wars, Muhammad Ali, and much, much more. On behalf of the National Archives, I thank President and Mrs. Carter for their commitment to the renewal of the library through this exhibit and an endowment that will continually enrich the community and provide new experiences through the years for visitors to the library. To the Carter Center, and those of you in the audience who joined President and Mrs. Carter in making this gift possible, our warmest appreciation on behalf of the National Archives and all those who will come here. To Jay and the staff of the library and the Carter Center, the talented exhibit designers, fabricators, and filmmakers, many of whom were working until I think 5.30 or 6 o'clock this morning to be ready for the opening, I want to say how proud we are of the work you've done, and I know everyone here will really appreciate your achievement. So to all the rest of you, enjoy the library, enjoy the museum, and come back often. Thank you very much, and happy birthday, Mr. President. Thank you, Sharon, for joining us. And uh, I had a chance to meet Sharon um, uh, as we were gathering, and she has been studying presidential libraries since she was a little girl, so uh, we know that you are doing a great job for us. Good morning. Um, President and Mrs. Carter and distinguished guests, I am pleased to be the 58th mayor of the city of Atlanta and to join you today. President Carter, we come today to celebrate. We come today to reignite our sense of community because your life and work offer lessons of humility, lessons of hard work, and lessons of vision. As a Sunday school teacher, 
as a father and engaged patriarch of your family, as the President of the United States. Your vision and work binds those who think differently, but binds us in love and service. Whether planting trees, or building houses, or monitoring elections, or interpreting the issues of the day, President Carter is bold, thoughtful, and inspiring. We thank you for what you've contributed, not just to the world, but also to Atlanta. Happy birthday. Good morning, everyone. Mr. President, Ms. Carter, uh, the mayor and I, we still have a few months in office, and we were prepared to claim equal credit for this beautiful day as your birthday present today until Vice President Mondale showed up and said it's Minnesota weather. So uh, <laughs> we are, uh, it is an absolutely gorgeous day for a grand occasion, and uh, Mary and I are delighted to be here. And I think uh, happy birthday is, uh, is certainly the theme today. And I think they say, Mr. President, inside every more experienced, older man, on their birthday is a younger man wondering what happened. Uh, and that's truer for, me, truer for me every day. I don't know about you. You seem to keep things happening. But really, one thing is clear to all of us is that uh, you don't appear to have lost a step. And we're grateful for that and your vigor and vitality on this 85th birthday. Birthdays are always a great time for reflection and for today. I think the most appropriate of that might be Forget about the past, you can't change it. Forget about the future because you can't predict it. And Mr. President, you need to forget about the present because I didn't get you one. So uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a special occasion and really a special place. And uh, Georgia uh, is proud to be the only state uh, in the Southeast to have a presidential library and the Carter Center attracts visitors and leaders from the round the world, and it literally has been used as a beacon of uh, uh, peace and human rights and, uh, in, in so many ways. And, and as we've heard already, not simply to visit and memorialize what has taken place, the good thing about this place is that it's a living and breathing organism working to solve problems affecting not only Georgians, but a people from around the world. Those problems of health and human rights and democracy. So we are delighted that this museum will be an inspiration to us all, both young and old. And that's true because of the work being done here is ageless. It's true because the Carter Center has in its fabric and in its spirit, it breathes in the fragrance of Jimmy and Rosalind Carter and their lives and their impact. Who would have believed that a farm boy from rural South Georgia would grow up to be president of the United States a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and a respected world leader. Well, one person did, President Carter. You remember your teacher, Julia Coleman. She told you and other classmates that it could happen, and it did. That story of opportunity speaks to young people around our state and around the world, it speaks to the identity of this great country as well as any you can find. The animating force behind that story is President Carter's lifetime work of energy, passion, and service. And that's why it's a privilege for me to be here today to reopen the Carter Presidential Museum. It's a privilege to recognize a very wonderful, great Georgian. Thank you, Mr. President, and may God bless our state and nation with many more Jimmy Carter birthdays. Joan and I are thrilled to be here with all of you today to celebrate the renaissance of the modern, marvelous Carter Center and to celebrate the magnificent achievements and the wonderful lives of Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. Uh, last night, Joan and I had a sneak preview of the new uh, exhibits, and I think you'll really like it. This new exhibit really will help Americans better understand the deep progress achieved under his administration. Here you can see not only the vast range 
of legislative accomplishments among the top of all the modern presidents. And you can also see and feel how Carter set the new tone of decency and honesty in the White House. As I, <clears throat> shortly after we left office, someone said, well, what do you have to be proud of? And I said, well, we told the truth, we obeyed the law, and we kept the peace. And I'm proud of it. In these displays, you can also see uh, in front of you how, president's courage, how the president's courage caused him to make decisions after decisions that were tough, where he made decisions that involved burdens and pain on the front end in order to solve problems so we could have a better country when it was over. Uh, the first Southern president in 120 years. He did it in part because he had the courage to stand up for civil rights in Southern Georgia when it wasn't too popular. <laughs> the same story on energy. It wouldn't have passed without his leadership. The Camp David Accords, everybody told him to stay away from that. The environmental reforms, on and on. It's a story of a president of courage who took the pressure up front so that we could all be better off. You, I hope you'll have a chance to see that fabulous multi-screen exhibit called A Day in the Life of the President. Look at that. It's, uh, I think, 15 hours. He gets up 5.30 in the morning. Uh, he's getting lazy now. And, uh, <laughs> And it goes until 11 o'clock at night, and it's, it's, it's wonderful history because it'll allow all of us to see what a president really goes through, the pressures, the decisions, and all the rest. They did work long and hard then, and they are working long and hard now to make this center, the best of them all, work for hope and health and peace in the world. As you may know, Carter and I have survived beyond, in off, beyond office longer than any former presidential, vice presidential team in American history. <laughs> not only that, not, we passed up our competitor, Adams and Jefferson, two years ago. <laughs> and I'm not being critical, critical of them, they were good too. <laughs> But we're still going. And look at the president. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Well, this is an emotional day for me. I look out over this audience, and I get the same feeling I get when I go through the library, because if you hear people from every stage of my life, and memories just come flooding back. And I just want to thank all of you for, because you are the ones that have made it possible for the things that we've been able to do, and I thank you. And I want you to meet my family. I want all my family to stand, all of my family that's here, our family that's here, can you stand up? Mm -hmm. And I, our youngest great-grandchild that is here is Henry, but he's not our youngest grandchild. We have one. He is, if you can believe this, Jack, my son, is his grandfather. <laughs> 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 and Chip, Chip is a grandfather. He's had a grandbaby born, uh, a baby growing, born 10 days ago. <laughs> and we have another granddaughter, in the hospital right now having another baby. <laughs> so we're gonna have we're gonna have 14, 15, 16 grandchildren, including great grandchildren. Our family is growing. It's been really wonderful. 
Well, we took Hugo, Amy's son, uh, through the library yesterday. He's 10 years old, and he liked it so much he didn't want to leave, and I thought that was a really good sign. Yes. And, uh, and there's so many interactive uh, exhibits that um, I, think, I think the whole family is gonna be able to enjoy it. Um, and also another thing that I'm really proud of is the lighting, and I don't mean just the lighting fixtures, because they took the curtains down. <laughs> I have been trying to get those curtains open ever since the library has been here. And finally, we have no curtains at all. And it's a totally different atmosphere. You can see out the beautiful grounds of the Carter Center. So that's another thing I'm really proud of. And um, I'm supposed to introduce Jimmy now. And I think everybody in the world knows it's his birthday because we've done enough interviews <laughs> to tell them all. And I'm um, thinking back over my um, 63 years married to him. <laughs> it has been an adventure from the first date <laughs> when it was a blind date. And um, we rode in the rumble seat of a car and went to the movie. Uh, lots of things that this, this morning that indicate how old I am. <laughs> Um, until this very day, an, an adventure all the way through. And where are we going from here? I do not know, but it's going to be exciting and interesting. Um, and he's, um, and so now I give you the man that I have been married to, as I said, for 63 years, and, and whom I have loved for all those many years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> and it's nice to know that um, we're going to be ended for the last 25 years talking about getting rid of those curtains. I, I don't know what we're going to talk about the next years to come, but that's what. There's no way that any of you could imagine the emotions that fill my heart and my mind at this moment. Looking at our family, the friends from Plains, the um, people that serve with me as governor and as president, and have helped the Carter Center flourish for the last 28 years. I'm overwhelmed. I'd like for everybody that had anything to do with my becoming governor or serving as governor or president to just to raise your hand. All right. And, uh, and uh, governor, you can raise your hand. The, the people that didn't want me to be governor or president, raise your hand. <laughs> if he was a Democratic governor, I'm sure he would have brought me a president this morning. <laughs> But he made up for it with his beautiful speech, and I'm really grateful to him. He's doing a fine job as president. In fact, he and I came from the same background with farmers. We used to sell fertilizer and seed uh, to farmers, so we know each other, and I've admired what he's done as president as well. I have my favorite photograph right outside my office, and it's, in, it's a picture of me and Fritz Mondale in the Rose Garden. And underneath, uh, Fritz wrote, from a vice president, maybe who served with a person that he respected, but from a only vice president perhaps in history that loved his president. And I love him as well. I don't know if all of you realize the historic nature of this place. On top of the hill right behind us where the flags are is where Sherman's headquarters were. And right behind me on a little knoll is where he stood to watch Atlanta burn. And in a way that affected my life and affected the life of all of you, what happened with the war between the states. 600,000 
of our kinfolks on both sides died. And it ended a time of slavery, which was a disgrace to our country. But I was born, along with many of you, during the next 100 years, beginning in 1865, when racial discrimination was still part of our legal heritage, where the United States Supreme Court, confirmed by the actions of the Congress and approved by, so far as I know, every distinguished lawyer in the country, said it's OK to have a segregated society. Well, like a lot of you, I was born in that time. And I think one of the most memorable things about the presentations that you'll see behind me in the new museum is the history of my 85 years of life, but also how they interrelate with your lives as citizens of America, and there's some others here who are my friends from other nations. We grew up under a stigma. And I was personally affected by it in a very troubling but also very beneficial way. I lived in a little community named Archery, about three miles west of Plains, Georgia. That's where we still live. I didn't have any white neighbors. All my playmates were African-American kids. I fought with them and wrestled with them and played baseball with them and fished in the same creek and worked in the same fields. And it strongly affected my life because I started out with complete innocence about the damage that was being done to my family prominent white folks and the black fam families around us. We went to separate schools, went to separate churches. And when I was about 14 years old, we went separate lives. I went on to become superior and my playmates all of a sudden became inferior. And I, I saw then the ravages of um, of a lack of respect for other people on an equal basis. And, and that really started my life off. And that story is told behind us in many ways. Later, I was in the Navy. I was a submarine officer. And the first time I ever knew for sure that that had been wrong was when Harry Truman ordained under great condemnation that in the military services, everybody was equal. And on my submarine overnight, the African and Hispanic stewards became equal to me. And 10 years later, Rosa Parks, as you know, didn't sit in the front back of a bus, and Martin Luther King Jr. became famous. Well, it's changed. Our country's changed. And, and all of that is told in here. And, and I think it shows that that's kind of a cycle of life, where we learn from our mistakes and we correct our mistakes in a n great nation where people can still speak up, just a few at a time, perhaps, like Martin Luther King Jr., who preached just a few hundred yards from here and changed my life and changed the lives of everyone in this audience. We went on, I did, to get a good education and, and had religious beliefs embedded in me as a child. And I served my country and then came back home as a farmer and I was elected to the state senator and governor with the help of many of you. Tommy Irvin sitting back there was one of my good friends, <coughs> still serving the people of Georgia. And it's been a chance for me to learn that all of us are in the same boat together. There's no distinguishing among us. 
and there's no distinguishing between us and those who live overseas, those who don't have a chance for a decent place to live or decent clothing or adequate food, no hope for an education or health care. Some people lack the opportunity for self-respect and an expectation that the future might be better than the present. That's what the Carter Center has done for the last 28 years with the help of many of you, our trustees in the audience as well. And, and I hope that when everybody goes through this new, exciting, dramatic, inspirational, educational, <laughs> inexpensive, <laughs> library museum that you'll put yourself in the role of all of us who share a common heritage and a common background and realize that each person can make a difference. One of the things that's impressed me, and this is the last thing I'll say, is how much we share from one generation to another. Even one generation of presidents and another. You'll see a presentation in the new exhibits of other presidential libraries, I think 11 others. And I've identified in going through my diary notes about 30 different things that troubled me and challenged me as president that exactly are still a major concern and responsibility of President Barack Obama 25 or 30 years later, the same things. Iran, the dream of peace in the Middle East, a comprehensive energy policy, a comprehensive policy for better health care for Americans, and I could go down the list. And that's important to know that we live in a changing society that still has things that don't change. Challenges, yes, but much greater opportunities. And I hope that every visit to the new exhibits will say, this is my responsibility too, to make sure that my children and grandchildren still live in the greatest nation on earth. Despite all its faults and tribulations, trials, mistakes, America has nurtured me. And I'm grateful for it. And grateful for all of you. Thank you very much. Join me and my classmates in singing happy birthday to my papa. I'm debating 
whether I should have preliminary remarks. <laughs> and I decided that I should. God blessed me to have benediction inauguration of the 44th president. I'm almost just as proud to have an opportunity to say a benediction at the 85th birthday of our 39th president. Sometimes we live so close to the forest, we don't experience the individual contribution of the trees. And I think sometimes we live so close to this president. I'm going to cut it short. Where was I? <laughs> President Carter is 85 today. Uh, five days from now, I'll be 88. So, so I'm, I'm allowed to forget some things. But I do want to reemphasize the blessing experienced day after day by this community to have this institution and this president in our midst. Sometimes we take for granted those things that are so monumentally important to our past, to our present, and to our future. I had a joke to tell about the governor, <laughs> but I forgot it. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, we thank you as we close this celebration for the birth and the life, the presidency, the perpetual ministry of Jimmy Carter. We thank you that you gave him a good four years leading our nation. And we're thankful that he used those four years in preparation for his career as the greatest former president that ever lived. Don't half applaud. If you want to applaud, applaud. Excuse me, Lord, for interrupting my benediction. <laughs> Thank you for his family, their love, and the strength that they've given him as he extends his ministry. Thank you for his companion, his roommate, his loving, supportive wife, who's been of such immeasurable benefit to him and his ministry. Thank you for the past, this institution. Thank you for what it has meant. Thank you for what it means. And now, Lord, we cry out from the depths of our being in thanksgiving for what this institution will continue to be 
to those yet unborn for education and inspiration and motivation and agitation. When this president leaves a legacy of agitation, he gets in trouble every so often. <laughs> Speaking truth to power. Thank you for our presence here. Thank you that you have led us to come to this place to be a part of this magnificent renaissance. Thank you, Lord. Bless now our country. In the midst of turbulence, this institution, this president, this family exercises a stabilizing force. And we know that while we may be in the midst of some turbulence, if we hold on to our faith, hold on to our firm commitment that this nation will be the land of the free and the home of the brave, that in a little while, when the morning comes, the clouds of darkness and turbulence shall be rolled away, and we shall enjoy a brighter day, a day full with a full measure of freedom and the spiritual strength that has characterized the presidency and the extended ministry of Jimmy Carter. Thank you now, Lord, for this institution. Bless all of those who work here, who labor here, who have contributed through the years, who will contribute in the future. We thank you that we're here in this time and in this place to be a part of this glorious blessing that you've given Atlanta and Georgia. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let all those who love the Lord and Jimmy Carter say amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Reverend Larry said he forgot to take up offering. have had another family member arrive too, Thomas, who's Henry's little brother. The Carter Presidential Library is now officially open. Please remain in your seats while our uh, guests and uh, uh, leave the uh, stage and then we'll open it right up. <laughs> <laughs>